Storyteller's Thread, a monthly podcast devoted to young adult literature and the art of storytelling. I'm your host, Sean Connors. On each episode, we invite an author for young adults to take us inside their work, and in doing so, to talk about their writing process, their inspiration for writing for young readers, and the general ins and outs of earning a living as a professional storyteller. So, whether you're a compulsive reader, an aspiring writer, a teacher or librarian, or simply a frustrated reader who's counting the hours until you get home and dive back into that novel that's waiting for you on your nightstand, this is the place for you. Hey everybody, it's the first day of February 2020. If you listen to this podcast on a regular basis, welcome back. And if you're a first-time listener, thanks for being here and thanks for supporting this program. Either way, whether you're a newcomer or a veteran listener, I'd like to take just a moment to recruit your help as I continue to build an audience for this program. There are actually a couple of different ways that you can help me with that. If you like what you hear, I'd ask that you please consider taking a second to rate the podcast on iTunes or Google Play or whatever platform you're currently listening to it on. Alternatively, and even easier, if you have a friend or a colleague who you think might be interested in this podcast, then you can help me by just recommending it to them. Either way, your support will help me keep this a viable project moving forward. This month, I'm talking with comic scribe, screenplay writer, and man of action, Joe Kelly. After receiving an MFA from New York University's Tisch School of the Arts, Kelly entered the world of mainstream comics, where he's written stories for some of Marvel and DC's most well-known characters, including Spider-Man, Superman, Deadpool, and the X-Men. He's also the author of several independent comics projects, including the graphic novel I Kill Giants, which was illustrated by Ken Nomura, and published by Image Comics. It's the story of Barbara Thorson, a young girl who struggled to deal with difficult life issues, leads her to retreat inward into a fantasy world of magic and monsters. In 2009, New York Magazine named I Kill Giants one of the year's 10 best comics. And a year later, in 2010, it was featured on the Young Adult Library Services Association's list of top 10 great graphic novels for teens. It won the Gold Award at the 5th International Manga Award in 2012, and in 2013, it was named the runner-up for the Gaiman Award, which acknowledges the best foreign comic book published in Japan. As if that's not enough, Kelly also wrote the screenplay for the 2017 film adaptation of I Kill Giants, which was produced by Chris Columbus and which stars the actresses Madison Wolfe and Zoe Saldana. Along with Joe Casey, Duncan Rulo, and Steven Siegel, Kelly's also part of Man of Action, a creative collective responsible for creating the animated series Ben 10, which currently airs on the Cartoon Network, not to mention the characters and team in Disney's Academy Award-winning film, Big Hero 6. While Kelly's professional accomplishments are no doubt impressive, equally impressive to me is his ability to reflect thoughtfully and with remarkable precision and clarity on his work as a writer and on the challenges associated with living a creative life. Having heard him talk about his work in the past, I knew I wanted to have Joe on as a guest from the moment that I conceived of this podcast. And when we finally managed to sync our schedules and find a time when we could sit down and talk, I was beyond excited. It's hard to put into words how much I learned about writing and creativity from talking with Joe, and I hope that'll be the case for you as well. And with that, let's dive into my conversation with Joe Kelly. I've been really looking forward to this conversation for a long time, if for no other reason that you're so incredibly productive as an artist. You're arguably best known for your work in comics, but you also write screenplays, you've directed an independent film, you're part of a writer's collective man of action entertainment that develops video games and comic books and movies, including, I should point out, one of my favorite animated films, Disney's Academy Award winning Big Hero 6, which I believe you helped create the characters for. So it's a big question to start with, I know, but I'm going to come out swinging in this interview. (laughs) What compels you to be so creative? Can you talk about the role of creativity in your life? (laughs) Well, thanks for uh, the softball question uh, to start (laughs) with. That's good. Um, It's funny that you mentioned it because I have actually been thinking about it a lot lately, partly because of the projects that I'm working on, partly because of the environment that 
man of action specifically in animation sort of sells to, you know, as everybody knows, the buyers are shifting constantly and studios have changed what they're looking for, you know, so there's a lot of, I, I'm finding myself asking a lot of questions about, well, what do I want to do and why do I want to do that thing? And I, you're catching me about two hours after having just seen the last Star Wars film. Oh, wow. Which is fun. I was just like, I want to make sure I saw it so nobody would spoil it for me. So my son and I gunned through all eight to go see Rise of Skywalker. And uh, for me, it was a wonderful payoff. That's all I'll say. I won't, I won't say anything spoilery. But I, I often go through these things about like, you know, are the things that we do, certainly as man of action, like, is it disposable entertainment or you're trying to aspire to like high art or, you know, what, what's the driver. And the, the best answer that I've kind of come to that, that feels right for me and feels the most, (laughs) it keeps me like out of anxiety and just kind of in a peaceful place is like, I've always wanted to tell stories. I've always enjoyed doing that. And if I can tell a story that takes some aspect of something I'm struggling with, and put it out there and somebody else is able to find it and has any impact on their life, whether it's to entertain and distract them for five minutes or to give them something to chew on that they can revisit or help them through a dark time or something. It kind of doesn't matter what they choose to do with it. If I've done that, then I've done my job. And I do really like connecting with the audience, which is good and bad, you know, because uh, I try not to look for validation. Uh, outside of my own self. Uh, And I'm pretty good about that in general. I start projects I like. I don't chase the market. Um, That's never been a a way that I've worked personally because it doesn't, you you can't produce quickly enough to feed a market that moves as as fast as art does. So I just find myself wanting to, you know, purge the demons, you know, like get these stories out uh, and hope that they find a home with whoever it is that, that comes across. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it does. And it brings up another question I had. As a young person, were there people in your life who encouraged you to be creative? Was that something that was valued or emphasized in your household when you were growing up? <laughs> I was very lucky. I had, um, I had very supportive teachers along the way, for sure, at a, at a really early age, sort of in elementary school and middle school, people who encouraged me to write and draw and do just sort of out of the box creative learning which was wonderful and a gift that i don't i don't know that i I give enough credit to in terms of my career and sort of the path that i wound up on my house was pretty supportive my mom is very laid back and was just like oh whatever you like to draw so go draw my father is a retired policeman was a retired policeman and um he didn't understand the creative instinct he didn't dislike it he thought it was cool i made stuff up but he didn't believe I had a job until I bought a house. So <laughs> he, he wasn't like, he wasn't unsupportive, but he was not exactly tapped into the thought process. And when I would show him like writing in college and things like that, and you know, I, I, I tend to write some dark things anyway, but the college stuff was particularly dark. He'd be like, you need to write funny things. People like to laugh. <laughs> he was not into looking inward or purging the demons. <laughs> As I mentioned, you're best known for your work in comics, having written stories for some of Marvel and DC's most popular characters, and that includes Spider-Man and Deadpool, the X-Men, and Superman. How do you get started writing comics, and how in the heck did you manage to get your foot in the door at Marvel and DC? (laughs) Well, I I was really very lucky, and literally like right place, right time kind of luck. My undergrad was at Binghamton University. I went there for art and theater, was kind of a knucklehead wound up graduating with a philosophy degree just so I could get out on time. And that more had to do with sort of messing up in classes and then feeling shameful and not going back because I had a couple of really good mentors, but I sort of blew it and then had too much of an ego to go back. So I got out on time Then I went to uh, work and I worked as a production assistant for about a year and I realized I was not equipped to carry heavy things. Um, and also kind of tapped out of the learning curve of being a PA. Because once you've been a, a PA for a while, you pretty much, you need to start to specialize. So I was headed towards like the art department or maybe like the grip department, which actually is carrying some everything, but it was, it was cool. I like that work. 
But I figured on a whim, I would apply to NYU for screenwriting because that was writing movies is, has always been a dream and directing them, you know, being involved in, in the movies in some capacity. So I got in for graduate school, which was a, a big shock. It was a small department of 20. And then I went to work in the department as a graduate student. So that paid for my tuition for two out of the three years. And while I was there, two editors from Marvel Comics came in, they wanted to start a program to cultivate new talent. They essentially felt like, you know, it was uh, the mid 90s, that they were kind of looking at the same people all the time. And they just thought maybe it was time to try to reach out and find some new voices. So James Felder, who currently teaches at NYU, but he had been a graduate, reached out to our department. And I always tell the story that Marvel contacted us and there was a letter sitting on the director's desk and she was kind of a playwright with a, you know, capital P, like that was what she was into. And that was what she wanted the writing department to be. Specifically, I was in the dramatic writing department at Tisch at NYU. It was not the film school, which is a different program. And um, there's playwriting and screenwriting. <laughs> Playwrights got a lot of preferential treatment. The screenwriters were, you know, oh, good luck with your movies. And, uh, and, you know, there was never any talk of comics or anything like that. And the secretary and I talked a lot about comics because she learned to read from Superman. She told me that, you know, she was sort of captivated by the pictures and wanted to know what Superman was saying. And that's how she learned to read. So she pulls me aside one day and says, there's a letter with Spider-Man sitting on the, the director's desk. And it's, I think it's going to wind up in the garbage. You might want to take a look. So I stole the letter <laughs> and read it and saw that it was James and, and Mark Powers is the other editor and, and they wanted to start this program. And then I put it back and then casually found the director and was like, hey, I heard Marvel contacted you. I know comics. And then we looked at the letter together and figured out what the story was. And then I offered to run the program. And that was really how I got my first job. They sort of taught comics backwards. Like we started with dialogue and then worked our way up to building an entire universe. So because in the early times together, we were doing dialogue and I happen to, I enjoy that part of writing. I have a little bit of an ear for it. I find it fun. They responded well to that and offered me my first gig. So in part, it was, I wouldn't call it male fraud or male <laughs> felony, but I did, I did take the letter. And I always, I always tell the story, um, A, I think I'm out of the, uh, statute of limitations, but be, <laughs> you know, th these opportunities pop up and you never know when they're going to pop up and you don't know what they're going to, what they're going to yield. But I think if we're creative people, we have to sort of try to put ourselves in the places where creativity is happening whenever possible and then take a chance. And sometimes that means taking a chance on ourselves. And sometimes it means taking a chance, meeting somebody new, et cetera. So I, I took that chance and rolled the dice with Marvel and that was how I got my foot in the door. You know, on that note of taking a chance on yourself, in addition to writing comics for Marvel and DC, you're also the author of several independent projects, including the graphic novel I Kill Giants, which was originally published serially by Image and which is now a graphic novel. I'm curious, do you have a preference for one or the other, writing for the big publishers or working on your own independent creative projects? Generally, I would say that my own projects probably are my preference, but they're also more challenging in terms of the literal production, because you kind of have to either have a partner who's able to work for free during the process. Cause you know, when you're, when you're generating your own, just like anybody making their own work, you're doing it for free. And I'm lucky enough that image will generally publish what I offer to them, but you know, you don't get paid unless the book makes money or you have to have the finances to be able to pay somebody. So, on a passion level and on a creative level, I'd rather spend the time getting to know my own characters and delving in and creating those worlds and telling those stories. That being said, I'm a fan, right? So I grew up with superheroes. You know, like I said, I just walked out of the culmination of 40 years of filmmaking. I, I'm a total fan for this stuff. So when I had the opportunity to write Spidey, that, that was a dream come true, you know, with no question. And to have been able to sort of check some of those boxes off to go, yeah, I worked on Superman. I had a run. Yeah, I wrote Justice League. I had a run. You know, it's a great feeling. I'm not going to lie. I would think, yeah. Yeah, so it's fun. You just get to tell a different type of story. And in that particular case, then it sort of 
can I bring something to this long legacy and this library of work behind a character? And if you can, that's a that's a great feeling to, you know, whether you create something new that other people build off of or just, you know, spin a good yarn that people talk about a couple of years later that, you know, that's always a nice feeling. So I've been lucky enough to do both. They're different. They're different mindsets. Our work in animation has been kind of more on the other people's character side than our own. But we have been lucky enough to do our own characters a couple of times, which has been great. And uh, it's the same thing. You know, it's it's really fun to work on somebody else's diamond property. But, you know, we, we created Ben 10. And that's kind of awesome, you know, and, and to meet kids, especially now, because it's been so long, to meet somebody who's going into high school or college and then like, oh, Ben 10 was my childhood. A, it makes me feel old, but B, <laughs> it's, it's cool to keep the cycle going. You know, there were the things that I loved and I grew up on and I cared about. And then you get to do that thing for somebody else. And that, that's an amazing feeling. Well, I follow you closely on Twitter and you'll often share insights into your work that really intrigue me and, and get me thinking. And one of them, <clears throat> you said, I'm going to quote you here. You said, the only time you feel in control of your destiny is when you're working on your own thing for its own sake. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, can you talk about what you mean by that? Yeah, so that's kind of when I, when you first asked me the question about why I do this work, uh, I, I was hedging a little bit because part of this mindset I've been in, especially lately, is really contemplating the whole art as commerce relationship. Hmm. Because it is challenging. It's a, it's a bizarre way to make a living. It's a wonderful way to make a living, without a doubt. And I'm, I'm very, very grateful that I've been able to do it you know, now for over 20 years. But if you're chasing not the trend, but the dollar, invariably, I wind up getting myself hooked up with jobs that I wouldn't necessarily pick if I was completely free. So when I am working on a project that's for me, I have no clue who's going to publish it or where, whether or not it's going to show up in a movie you know, or on TV or whatever. I'm writing things just for myself. That's certainly the time I feel the most in control creatively and kind of of my you know, creative destiny. Like that thing may never get published. That thing may never see the light of day as a movie. But I know that that time is not wasted because I'm honing my craft. I'm scratching whatever creative itch needs to be scratched at that time. So for me, that's, that's a critical feeling. It's kind of, it's an extension for me of the foundations that you sort of learn when you're very early on and anything is possible. And you're just kind of like, you're learning craft, but your imagination is running wild. Some of that gets beat out of you, I think, as you a enter the workforce, but B start doing this stuff for hire. And it's great to tap back into that. If for me, it's a necessity. Otherwise, honestly, I would feel kind of lost because being a hired gun only gets you so far for, for me. Like I, I've been, there are people who love it and really like just doing work for hired gigs and getting to play with other people's toys. But when I get too lost in that, I, I, I just lose the thread of why this is fun. So, you know, when I'm focused on my own work, even if I don't know who's going to publish it, it tends to work out. You know, and we we tell young writers and artists all the time, the work is never wasted. You know, and, and I've been lucky enough to see that play out to be true. You know, we had a a comic book that nobody bought. There was like two issues published, and that became Generator Rex ten years later. So it's like that work was not wasted. You know, we got a TV show, a cartoon out of it that a lot of people really dig, and we still get asked about today, or something like Steampunk, which is like a you know weird project. People still ask. Chris Pichello and I about it all the time. And then even, you know, I, I very, very weird books that uh, I have a couple of books that I know, like literally a thousand people read. But every once in a while, I'll meet one of those thousand people and they really like that book. Um, and that's a great feeling. So I don't care. I, you know, I don't look at the numbers and the farther, the farther away I am from that stuff, the more in control and creative I feel. It's hard to believe. But 2020 marks the 10th anniversary of I Kill Giants publication. That's impressive longevity for a graphic novel. Whenever I go to the bookstores, I see that book on the shelf. And I think it speaks to how readers have received it. 
Before we talk about the graphic novel, though, would you mind giving listeners who haven't read it a sense of what I Kill Giants is about? Sure. I, the elevator pitch, without sort of you know spoiling anything, is that I Kill Giants is about a young girl named Barbara Thorson. Uh, she's in middle school. She is a bit of an outcast. She likes the sort of nerdy stuff that I always like. She's into D and D and has a pretty rich fantasy life and is convinced that a giant is coming to her town and that she has to kill it. And it's the story ultimately of how this fantasy life and her real life collide and what the fallout of that is. Do you remember, and it's been a while, do you remember where the conceit for the story came from? Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's funny. I was just, I was just reading something about uh, this book about creativity called big magic and it's by Elizabeth Gilbert. Uh, She wrote eat, pray, love. And I, I've actually never read that book, but I've seen her on do TED Talks and I heard her on a podcast and she's very, very cool in the way she approaches creativity and her career. And she's just a fascinating woman to me. So I was reading this book it, and it talks a lot about how what we do generally is a sort of daily grind. You have to show up, you have to put your butt in the chair and you just have to type. And then hopefully all the gears and pistons fire and you get something usable. But if not, you're at least putting down words that then you can fix later. And that's when craft comes in. But it's super rare that you get this sort of lightning in a bottle moment. And Giants was one of those times. I haven't had many, but Giants was one of them. And uh, what had happened was my my father uh, had been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And, you know, it wasn't a big deal for a long time until it became a, a big deal. And then he was in the hospital and he wound up losing a leg, but he got out of the hospital. But at that time, I had never spent an iota of of energy thinking about the mortality of my parents. And I was, you know, I was an adult. At the same time, my daughter, Claire, was was very, (laughs) she's a very precocious kid. She was very, she was little and I was a new parent and I was trying to guide her on the path of loving superheroes and and D and D and all that good stuff was not fully successful, though she's super creative. And I just sort of was wondering, well, if a kid like her was confronted with sort of a large issue at home, what might that be like? You know, and I took my dad to physical therapy to learn how to walk on this new leg, and I brought a legal pad and literally in the hour wrote this nine page outline that became I Kill Giants, and it never varied like the whole story was there in those nine pages and then i expanded upon it over the next couple of months and wrote the script and then immediately wrote the film script after that just for myself because i i liked it so much so that that was where it came from and it was uh it was a complete like i said a lightning bolt i I, it's very very rare that happens so when those things come you you write them down fast in rereading the book in advance of our talking i found myself thinking about the talent that you show for setting up page turns, which is incredible. And that got me thinking about all the different things that you must have to think about and attend to in the course of scripting a story, things that go beyond the actual story itself. Mm. As best I can, I want to try to get in your head and understand how you think about comic storytelling. When you're drafting a story, what kinds of things do you have to attend to or what sorts of decisions do you have to make that maybe a lay person might not think about or consider? Sure. That's a great question. And I, I really appreciate that you notice the page turns because that's, that's actually a, in the forefront probably of the, the various plates I'm spinning in a given script that I, I focus on that quite a bit. I mean, there's the obvious stuff. I do an outline first. I really like to know where a story is going. I'm very conscious of if it is coming out in chapters What does that mean? Trying to leave people with the right kind of cliffhanger or emotional investment that they're going to come back for the next story. That extends to a business model where you actually know that the first three episodes or three issues of a book generally are pre-ordered before the book is published. And it's the fourth episode is where there's always a dip. So you're hoping that you can get people back by issue five. (laughs) You know, some of that is involved. But the actual page turn part of it, I was taught really early on by, you know, by James as critical for comic storytelling. I mean, it's it's one of those few things. I don't even know if novels really 
are paced out that way. I'm curious whether or not people adjust page count or word count on a page to facilitate literal page terms. But that was the way I was taught, that we try to end every spread with a dramatic question or an emotional beat that drives you to want to turn that next page. And it may sound sort of academic because, well, if you bought the comic, aren't you going to read it? And it's only 22 pages long. But it makes the experience propel you forward. And then that extends, you know, that sort of goes back to the training that I got at NYU and dramatic writing in general about trying to craft every scene that pushes the next scene. And every line of dialogue is supposed to really serve a purpose, whether it reveals character, or preferably doesn't push the plot forward, but preferably reveals something interesting about the characters and the themes. And then my actual process is I sort of write a big, ugly draft and then go back and do a lot of editing. I Kill Giants went through like seven drafts probably as a comic because I had friends who were going to draw it and then dropped out for various reasons. And it, it's funny because a few of the people have, because it, I, was, I wrote the book for one friend. He couldn't do it. Somebody else I met, they were interested. They couldn't do it. Then later on, it was like, oh, I really should have done that book, uh, which was very kind of them. But um, I sat with it for a while. And like I said, I wrote it as a film also, just more as an academic exercise than anything else. And then had a friend who was helping me kind of go back and forth with notes. And then those notes would feed into the comic. And it became a sort of big, crazy thing. How did you come to Ken and Nomura as the artist for the book? Oh, so I, yeah, another another very lucky serendipitous thing. I was lucky enough to be invited to a comic convention in Spain, and I was sitting next to Ken at a table. And one of the cool things about the European conventions, it happens in Artist Alley at the cons here, but European conventions are much more like art festivals. They do have their big sort of marketplace comic cons, but otherwise they're more like a celebration of the arts and the artists and and the fans, you know, and, and you, it's very intimate. So when you have a signing, you know, they'll put you with somebody. And sometimes because of my lack of familiarity with their market or who the players are, I might not know who I'm sitting next to. So Ken was literally brand new and was putting out his first book and was sitting next to me after I'd had a couple of years in the business. And I, he, he played it very cool at the time. I, I literally only just found out within the last couple of years that he had not actually graduated school yet. Oh, wow. So much like my <laughs> my stealing of the letter, he just was like, Oh yeah, I'm a you know, I'm a professional comic book artist. <laughs> and uh he had this little book of all of his student work and because he was in art school, he had many different styles he was experimenting with. So I said, Hey, would you be interested in possibly doing this thing? Because I there was so much energy in the book that he had and his storytelling. I, I look for, you know, like that's to go to your earlier question about the things that go through your head, you know, your artist, well, you know, what kind of storytelling they're capable of. So you're making decisions on what panels not only tell the story, but allow your artist to tell the story the best way they can. So like writing for Ed McGinnis is different than writing for Ken which is different than writing for Bax Fiumara. You know, it's like they're all very talented in very wildly different ways. And it's just helpful to know who it's for. So Ken said yes. And uh, because he was a student, he was finishing up school, he was able to sort of have a long development period, uh, as I say, with air quotes around it, because that was his way of kind of delaying me while he was trying to graduate. <laughs> but he did all the designs for the book, and that's what's in the back of the the anniversary edition, the Titan edition, you know, all those designs and stuff. But that's how I got to meet Ken. And we've been friends ever since. I mean, he's a, he's a great guy. And I'm, I'm writing, I should have done this many, many years ago, but I'm writing a big graphic novel for him now, which I'm really excited about. It's very close to the first draft being done, but it's also the first time he's ever seen like my raw writing as opposed to something that was polished already seven times. When you collaborate on a project like that, and you have a division of labor between writer and artist. How do you approach navigating that relationship? I would think it has the potential to be fraught with some tensions. Oh, 100%. Yeah. I, I, again, I've been so lucky. I literally can't even count on two fingers, I don't think, 
the times where I've I've butt heads with an artist in a way that was not ultimately productive. Uh, I can really only think of one or two. Most of the people I've worked with have been incredible collaborators who, you know, it, it's a visual medium, right? So we happen to live in an era where writers are are getting a lot of props and getting a lot of accolades. And that, of course, I'm, I'm biased. I'm very happy to see that for people. But it wasn't that long ago that it was, you know, just all about the artist and nobody knew who was writing the book. So I feel like the pendulum swings, you know, in the industry and in, in the market. But for the actual writing process, for me, I usually pitch a story I want to tell. The artist kind of is in or out. And then I ask them, what do they like to draw? So if there's somebody who really loves big vistas, I try to work that in. Or somebody who's like, oh, I really like quiet. You know, I love talking heads. I want to just do a quiet interior drama. I try to work those scenes in. Because they, they have to commit to a different time period than I do. Like the active hours of working that page exceed mine. You know, I may be doing a lot of thinking and pulling stuff out of the ether and then trying to put it into a workable form in the script. But they've got to now take that, translate it into their own visual language, and at best do a page a day if they're fast and possibly much slower than that. And what took me maybe, you know, I can write a regular superhero comic quickly, you know, a couple of days. And I can write it in one day if I really have to, but it's, you know, my preferred pacing is a few days. That's a month, month and a half worth of work for them to draw that same comic. And something like Giants can spend a year doing, basically. And this, this new book is like 300 something pages. So he draws a lot quicker now, actually, his style, because it's so loose and open. He can actually draw very, very quickly because we do thorough breakdowns and have a, a language that we use together. But it's still three or four months. You know, there's no question he's going to be working for a long time on this this monster when it's finally done. So I really want to make sure that that the artist is having a good time. And then Ken specifically brought a ton to Giants. You know that Barbara's got the the rabbit ears because. She was based on my daughter who had curly hair. When she was very young, she, people always used to, old people especially, would be like, you look just like Shirley Temple. And my daughter was so sassy, she'd be like, no, I don't. You know, she would just go back at these old people. And um, would partly inspire you know, Barbara's personality because she's sassy. And Ken basically said, every time I try to draw this curly hair, it looks terrible because we're doing black and white. I just don't have it. It looks like either spaghetti or a cloud, I just, I can't make it work. And he said, what if she wore hats and animal ears and stuff? Like, since I'm drawing in a manga style, the kids that I know, because uh, Ken is uh, half Spanish and half Japanese, so he spent parts of his life in Tokyo and, and Spain. He's like, the kids that I know that would be into this sort of thing might wear rabbit ears or might wear cat ears or weird hats or whatever. And at first, I, I was actually not, sure it would work. And then I, I saw the first image of her with the rabbit ears and the hammer. And I was like, yep, done. You know, sounds great. So if I didn't give Ken that kind of freedom, then we would not have the Barbara that I think has resonated with people, like you said, you know, and, and kept that book alive. Both the graphic novel and the film have been deeply impactful for people, kids and adults alike. What is it about the story, do you think, that speaks so deeply to people? Well, it's kind of you to say that. I really appreciate it. And it, and it is so meaningful to me. <laughs> it's funny. I was just talking to um, to a, a mutual friend. Uh, I'll name drop and say it was Scotty Young. And um, Scotty and I have been friends for a while. And he had only recently met Ken uh, at a convention. And he told Ken about how much he loves I Kill Giants. And he said Ken was kind of quiet, but we had only just met. And then later on, after they became friendly, Ken said, you know, people come up and talk to me about I Kill Giants, and it's never occurred to me that I was working on something that would have this sort of a lifespan, but also would invite people to share their pain with me. So he was sort of taken aback by that. And, uh, and that's been the experience. I mean, it's been, it's really beautiful and 
there have been more than one comic convention where somebody has come to, over to the booth and tears have been shed by them or by me or both talking about I Kill Giants. And I like to think it's because uh, it's truthful. And what people have said to me, you know, it was it was born out of a certain kind of pain, but there's also a lot of hope to it. And for me, it was a roadmap and really did become a roadmap for navigating some big stuff in life. And I always feel a challenge when I talk about the book to not want to give stuff away, you know, or the film, because it's I think the less people know about it, the better. But usually when they get to the end of it, they're really surprised and they're surprised what Barbara is processing and how deeply they connect to that, whether they're experiencing something similar or, or something different in their own lives. And it's just been described to me as, as just a, like an emotional booby trap. Like nobody knows what they're getting into and they think they're just following this sassy chick. And then all of a sudden they just get a left hook and they're like, oh my God. And then they see themselves in that kit. Cause you're really rooting for Barbara. You know, she's such a, such a fun underdog character. And, and I think a lot of us see ourselves in her. And, and I've, I've literally, we've run the gamut. I mean, I've seen young kids have seen both the movie or read the book and, and talk to me about their experience. I've had 45 year old guys at the booth tearing up talking about it. I mean, everybody in between. I mean, it's, you know, men, women, it's, it's been, uh, it, it's a great pride in my life that that book ha has had an impact on people. Well, and I, I can vouch for everything that you said. I taught that book a number of times, and it's one that my students always, it resonates with them really deeply. And it does with me as well. And, you know, I can tell you that without revealing the ending, it's a book that I come back to in my life when I confront difficult situations, I'll say. Right. You know, it's sort of a, a template to approach life. And it does speak to people, I think, in a very profound way. No, oh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And and it's funny, I, having having just gone through, we've had a bit of a rough end of the year in, a, in our family. And I've sort of had to remind myself of some of my own, you know, it's a, the do what you say, not as I do kind of scenario. And it's like, you know, it's not any kind of a spoiler, to just that, you know, one of the taglines of the book is, you know, we're all stronger than we think. And, and it's such a simple concept. But then when you actually see it deployed, whether it's in the people around you or in yourself, it can change your entire perspective on a, on a challenging time in your life. So yeah, I, I'm with you there. It's uh, and and I appreciate you sharing that. It's, I'm glad it strikes for people and uh, never would have thought that it, you know, like you said, for our little book to have lasted this long is word of mouth primarily, because certainly we don't advertise the book. And it's been such an honor to me that so many librarians and teachers have been bringing it into the schools. That's huge to me. I mean, A, I love just the fact that graphic novels are showing up in schools, but to have it actually taught, you know, by folks like yourself uh, is amazing to me. You know, that's, uh, that's huge. So thank you for doing that. Absolutely. In the time we have left, I want to dig into your creative process a bit. When you have a day to be creative and you don't have people like me interrupting you, <laughs> what's that day entail from the time you get up to the time you sit down at your computer to the time you finally shut it off for the day? What's, what's a creative day look like for you? It's funny because for me, it does evolve over time because there's a difference between creative days and working days, which may sound contradictory. But so on the days that I, I know exactly what I'm doing, I get up early enough when my kids were both here, they're both in college now, but when they were both here, I would get up with them and see them off and try to, you know, inhale coffee and, and be in the chair as early as possible. The first half of my day is always whatever I personally want to work on. So that would be might be a spec screenplay, it might be a graphic novel I'm working on, or just some comic ideas, but it's, it's just my time. And I'm trying to basically type out as much as I can, like brain dump, don't worry if it's good, just get it done. If I know I'm heading towards the goal line on something, then that's the script, you know? So like right now, the thing I'm writing for Ken, that's my morning all the time. So it's just get those pages done, get them written, I'm probably 50 or 60 pages away from the end right now, and I'm hoping I'm going to finish by 
end of the year. So that'll be my morning. <laughs> then I eat lunch. I try to eat it not at my office. Sometimes I fail. And often during that time, I, uh, I goof around and play a game or something on the iPad. I try not to check email until that time. Because I know that if I get caught up in emails in the beginning of the day, it can just derail me. It really throw me. So for me, I mean, I've had I've gone through periods in my life where I've used some of those apps that like don't allow you access to your web, your own uh, internet, and all that sort of stuff. So then the the back half of the day, if there's man of action business to attend to, or more administrative stuff, I kind of hit that in the afternoon. If there's a script that's uh, sort of a for hire thing, that's more of a middle of the day. And then I, I tend to hit like a second wind and it's always around like 4.30 or something. It's, it's strange when it happens. And that's usually a good flurry of writing. And then I try to leave like, you know, you might've heard writers or people talk about this before, where it's like leave some gas in the tank. So I might know how a scene is going to end, but I don't write the whole scene. I just sort of leave it there so that the next morning it becomes easier to jump right to work because I already know what I'm writing. Uh, it helps the ball rolling quicker. And then then it's dinner and family time and zoning out to, um, well, hopefully not zoning out, usually watching some some decent TV or film. And uh, and I, I do still play a lot of video games, so that's part of it too. But then I also have these creative days that are, just kind of weird exploratory stuff. I take a lot of, I love photography. So if I can go out and just shoot photos, uh, I'll do that. Sometimes I kind of try to dust off the old art supplies and mess around with drawing or painting, a uh, little tiny bit of sculpting, things that are really don't have it like a quote unquote purpose, but they're just play. And the more I can do that, I actually find the better the writing gets. But it's tough because it doesn't feel like work. So the guilt often of, you know, when you have active shows in production like we do at Man of Action, it becomes challenging to go, oh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to try to sculpt something today. And I haven't done sculpture for 20 years when, you know, there's a script sitting that somebody is waiting for to storyboard. But integrating that kind of play into my life, uh, I just have found is more and more critical. Because it's too, we, we're distracted all the time anyway by nonsense and the internet. So I might as well be distracted by something that feeds me creatively. As I mentioned, Joe, you're active on Twitter. And a couple of months ago, you shared an insight about writing that you suggested is critical for aspiring as well as professional writers. Namely, and I'll quote you, that practicing the craft as often as possible with full acceptance that it may be for an audience of one. Yeah. <laughs> And you went on to say, that's the only way to survive creativity as a lifestyle. What do you mean when you say that writing regularly is the only way to survive creativity? Well, it's, you know, we all want to, on some level, make the thing that's going to go out into the world and bring us, whether it's fame, fortune, followers, you know, the great American novel, whatever it is, right? And if we get caught up in that trap of looking for that external validation, which I do all the time, I'm definitely not, I'm not above it. Um, you, you, I find myself in conflict with my creative process. So the idea that I work on things, I mean, I have plenty of screenplays that are half finished or I did one pass and never went back to comic books that I started writing for somebody and then they dropped out that are just sitting in a drawer, I don't ever think of that as wasted work because I learned something working on those pages. I kept the creative saw sharp, so to speak. So those pages, maybe nobody will ever see them, but they get me to where I am now. So it's like, you know, when I sit down the next time to write on the script for Ken, it's the culmination of all the things that I've done up to this point that are going to get me there. And I can't ever worry about, well, who's going to publish it? Who's going to read it? Is it going to become a movie? Is it going to become something else? Like I just make the thing to make the thing. And it may sound easy <laughs> because it's like, oh, well, Joe's been in this industry now for 20 years, so you can do whatever he wants. 
But it really is no different than when I first started because I was writing weird plays that nobody ever saw. They were things that amused me, you know, and like I said, I, I don't chase trends. So even when I was on Superman or Spider-Man, I'd write the Superman stories I thought I would like to read. And luckily enough, some other people wanted to read those too. But if I looked at the numbers and the sales numbers, I would freak out. So I tell the stories that interest me because you, you spend a lot of time, right? And, you know, this is across the board creativity. So whether your creative Jones is music or art, you know, visual art, or it's just the way you decorate your house, like it doesn't really matter to me. You have to do these things for yourself. And if you choose to release them into the world, you got to do so with no expectations. Because if those expectations are the things that will ultimately kill you, like they are the, the enemy of creativity. The thing is just asking to be made. So you make it and then you go move on to the next thing and don't worry about it. And it's, it's hard to wrap your head around that, especially if you want to make a living at it and have a career, etc. But then that's why we, especially for young people, and they don't always want to hear this, but we, you know, we tell new creatives all the time, have your survival job, make it a job that allows you to do the things that you want to do, and then make the time to do those things as often as you can. We used to tell people every day, I, when I say we, it's man of action, guys. But I, I found that that actually is not fair. That there are some people that they literally can get an hour a week or they can only do their weekends or stuff like that. And I don't think that's any less valid than somebody who sits at the typewriter or sits at the computer every day. But when you pick that time, you make that time sacred and you make it for yourself and the thing you're creating. After that, it's out of your hands. You know, I just I just spoke to a producer on a call yesterday about a project and I've never met her before. And she was lovely. And it was one of those calls where you, you leave kind of floating on air because her whole thing was like, I love this project. Why would we ever want to modify it? to try to you know, appease a buyer that may or may not exist. Let's just make the thing we wanna make. And if we don't find the right partner, then at least we tried. That was the greatest thing I could have heard from a producer <laughs> ever, because uh, it makes you wanna just do your best work. Because then the win is doing the work. The win is not, did I get my movie produced? Did I get my comic made? The win is, uh, or comic published, I should say. The win is I did the thing. And now move on to the next one. I want to pick up on a theme. You know, several times you've referenced this, and this is something that I've found in the past year and a half talking with different writers and creators. You know, I've come to appreciate the sacrifice that a person has to make in order to pursue a creative life. Right. I've heard you say that even at this point in your career, 20 years on, you have to fight for every gig that you get. Right. You know, with that in mind, what keeps you going? What drives you to show up at your computer every single day and write? <laughs> I, the jokey answer I want to give is like, I've got two kids in college. <laughs> <laughs> the paycheck. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. But the, um, that, I mean, honestly, that's the, if I'm going through any kind of, um, you know, existential crisis in general, it is answering that question. You know, it's not so much like I, I've had a great life. I'm very proud of my career. I'm, I'm, I love the projects I'm working on. I love the people I work with. I've been seriously, you know, blessed by the universe to get to do what I do. But it is hard, <laughs> and and it becomes hard. And you know, the, I recently saw somebody post something like, you know, there's that old aphorism where it's like, oh, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. And then the person's like, clearly, this person did never create a work in their <laughs> life. Because you do every day, it's it's kind of like ripping open a scab. Like you, you're going to bleed for this thing and you have to sort of put yourself in a very vulnerable position. You have to fight back your own ego and you have to, you're opening yourself up to rejection and you invariably play. And part of playing is falling down and skinning your knees and realizing, oh, I shouldn't have, ridden my bike so fast at that ramp, you know, it's all that sort of stuff just on the intellectual side of it. And so the reward has to be the work. And so 
When I get up every day and I go, okay, I'm going to make some stuff on my best days when it's not like a for hire gig that just feels like a for hire gig, which is part of it. That's part of my survival job. It is because I feel like I have a voice. I've been around long enough to believe in that now, uh, which that's a gift. Like not everybody has that kind of, uh, I don't even know if it's confidence. It could be just you know, blind arrogance. I don't know. But it's just, I think I have something to say. I feel like there are some people that enjoy this, these things that I say. So I'm going to sit down and I'm going to try to, to tell those stories. And that's kind of what keeps me going. I, I enjoy it. I love using my imagination. And it's one of the nice things about comics. I mean, I do want to write a novel at some point because I, I toyed with prose and I really enjoyed it. And that's a very solitary thing, I think, until you get to the editor. But the, one of the beautiful things about comics is that direct collaboration with the artist. So when I'm working with Ken and I get to send him pages and he's like, oh my God, I laughed at this, 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 and this. I already won. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm already there. And then somebody whose talent I deeply respect is willing to take their time and invest and create and build upon that foundation. That's a wonderful feeling. I mean, you just, you just feel like you're a part of something bigger. And it's the same with the guys at Man of Action. You know, we, we get together on projects that may never go anywhere. Sometimes they're just pitches. Sometimes they're for things that are actually going to go forward into production. But when everyone's bringing their best game, it's fun. Like you, you challenge one another, you reach for the best story, you, you get those aha moments, which are the best, something you didn't expect. I just heard the term story gravity from somebody, which I had never heard before. And I thought that was really interesting where you essentially, the story is just begging you to go to a certain place, not because it's a, a trope or a cliche, but it's just, oh, you've created this unexpected, but inevitable path. That's that's like archaeology for us. You know, that's that's the discovery of the thing that made you want to sit down and write this project in the first place. And that's that's a wonderful feeling. It's it's really hard to um, it's really hard to replicate that in life. There's not a lot of wonderful mysteries. <laughs> so when your brain dumps one in your lap or the universe, however you choose to look at it, it feels pretty great. I think there's a tendency for people to think of writing as this very insular, individualistic act. Mm. Right. Like in the popular imagination, the image of the solitary writer who's locked alone in a room and hammering away at a keyboard. But that's not always an accurate representation. You're talking about sharing your work as it's in process with Ken or sharing work with the other members of your writing collective, Man of Action. How do you approach? Let's take that example of Man of Action. How do you approach co-creation? Like when you guys are developing a project, what does your creative process look like or entail? (laughs) <laughs> it's a fun one because there are four of us and we've known each other for so long. I mean, we've, we've literally been in business, you know, since 2000, it is like working with your brothers, which, you know, I don't know if you have siblings, but it's, you know, it's good and it's bad. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you all know each other's buttons to press and how to press them because you help put them there. <laughs> you know? So what we try to do is usually what will happen is somebody will, whether it's a a sort of for hire gig or something that somebody cooked up, someone has an in. They've got their a vision for the project or a, a gut instinct. Like, I don't know what this is yet, but I feel like it's X, Y and Z. And then we all start picking it and asking questions and bring in our own influences because we're very, very different writers, the four of us. And Duncan's also an artist. So if something has the visual component, he, he comes in from another perspective. So we, we start kind of, we're simultaneously attacking the idea and trying to build upon the idea at the same time. And then whoever it is that sort of spearheads the given project, they become the filter and they get a sense of like, yes, this feels right. No, nah, that's not quite right. And as they're honing it into shape, then the craft kicks in. And we all, again, hit craft from a different direction. I'm very structure oriented. I, you know, I love structure, but I'm also super character focused. And somebody else might be like Steve is, uh, Siegel is theme became his thing. You know, like all he cares about is theme. He's like story will work itself out. 
I just need to make sure this theme is resonating in all these characters. And then somebody else might be more plot oriented. They're really good at the machinations of, you know, how do I move the chess pieces so it's satisfying and you get like, you know, the heist movie that you need, you know, that kind of stuff. And then we know enough and we've done enough writing both together and separately that when an idea works, even if it's not my idea, I can go, yep, that one works. Let's go with that. And then we make our decisions as quickly as possible so that we can get to a superstructure of a story or a pitch or a universe build or whatever, and then make any kind of fine tuning decisions. And then if it's for a client, then we know we're going to get notes and we go for that. You know, did they like it? Did they not like it? But we're pretty good now at, at going, okay, this person's in the driver's seat. We're going to make sure we, we are doing everything we can to help them succeed using the tools that, you know, a shared toolbox, essentially. So what can people look forward to from Joe Kelly in 2020? Do you have any projects beyond the graphic novel you're working on with Ken that you're able to talk about or that people should be excited about? Sure. Well, uh, for Marvel, I'm doing Deadpool The End, which is a, a fun one shot. Uh, Mike Hawthorne is drawing it. Looks great. And, you know, The End books are pretty fun. Obviously, I love Deadpool. And so was, they were kind enough to offer that to me. And uh, it's a it's a very Deadpool the end. <laughs> so that's <laughs> that's going to be good. Seeing what I can get past all of the the editors. <laughs> then, uh, you know, we have a show on Cartoon Network Man of Action called Power Players. So for the younger, younger audience, uh, it's kind of had a soft launch. It's going to come on in earnest for 2020. Um I'm working on this book with Ken called The Mort Immortal Sergeant. I don't know when that's going to show up. That'll be probably the earliest would be the very end of next year because it'll take a little while. And then and then hammering away at a bunch of pitches and stuff, because like I was saying before, in the land of this ever-changing landscape of streaming and, and weirdness, we're just trying to sell stuff right now, sell ideas. And we have a lot of irons in the fire both I have individually and Man of Action has as a group. So we're kind of in that cycle of um, of creative work, which, you know, it's, it's part of the gig. It, it's sort of the downside of this kind of thing. Like sometimes you have a steady flow and you know, oh, I've got my projects all lined up. And then sometimes you have your projects lined up and then one falls through or somebody gets fired or there's a regime change or whatever, and then those projects go away. So right at the moment, we're in the heavy pitching cycle. So um, you will probably find out when I find out <laughs> about some of these projects, but, um, definitely more, uh, there, there's some, some stuff in the works, some talks about some other things at Marvel and some other comic book stuff, but it's not sort of set yet that I can tell you. Um, I do want to, you know, try to do another short film. I'd like to, uh, pursue that. And also Poughkeepsie, which was the short film that I did with the help of very kind people on Kickstarter was a couple of years ago and I feel like I can now sort of post it and put it out in the, on the internet. Um, so yeah. Sounds like a pretty busy year coming for you. Yeah, I hope so. I, you know, hopefully it will be the good kind of busy and, and to be totally honest, there's going to be a lot of stuff that I'm going to work on that nobody's ever going to see. <laughs> because <laughs> That's part of it. That's part of the game is it's um, whether it's just for my own development uh, and my own Jones, you know, trying to, chase something down um or for you know work that maybe never you know gets to see the light of day for reasons that are out of our control but yeah that's the goal is to just um i, th I think the focus is really more on some creator owned stuff going into 2020 because uh, we've done a lot of licensed projects as man of action for a while so uh, the marvel stuff notwithstanding I think focusing on more creator projects is something I'm going to do. Well, thank you so much, Joe, for taking time to talk with me. I deeply appreciate it. I always learn so much from you. Oh, thank you so much. And with that, we've reached the end of the show. Thanks as always for tuning in and supporting this podcast. And thanks too to Joe for making time to talk with me about writing and living a creative life. If you haven't read I Kill Giants, do yourself a favor and rectify that. I promise you won't regret it. And don't stop at the graphic novel either. The movie, which stars Madison Wolf and Zoe Saldana, is equally wonderful and well, well worth your time. I look forward to seeing you back here next month when we'll continue to talk about the craft of storytelling. 
Until then, happy reading. Thank you.